all for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Great job, Toto. That is so good. Can we clap for Toto, please? Awesome. Well, hey, I'm excited to be here today. And Seagull Sunday, you know, we, we meet once a month on the first Sunday of every month. And last month we had five, five uh, weekends. Does anybody feel like that, like, pr- like doubled our time in terms of being away? I felt so like, I am so ready for Seagull Sunday. I want to be connected to, to, uh, to um, my, my church family. So I missed you guys. Uh, but it is good to be back again. We get to celebrate together all that God has done. Again, if this is your first Sunday afterwards, we have, we cater in food and we like to hang out and just be connected and, and be together. So you're welcome to join us for that. But before I jump into my message, what I want to, I want to talk about dreams in just a little bit. Um, I heard, I heard a story, a testimony, a testimony, something that we share that we say, God, we testify, we share what you've done. And we, as we share it, we're proclaiming that, God, you would do it again. You just, you, you, you uh, reproduce the good word and the good thing you've done in my heart. So I got Ken and Angela Deller shared something with me yesterday that just like, it blessed me so much. So I want them to come on up. They're going to share just something really awesome that happened in Ken's life. Angela had a big part in that. So come on up, guys. And uh, they're going to share. has nothing to do with my message, but everything to do about Sego. All right? So here we go. All right. So last weekend, we just uh, took a road trip, uh, extra day and took the road trip to California to Angela's, um, Angela's nieces and nephews. And second day, we all went to a little pool party and I jumped in the water and did a down the slide, had fun. And then Angela gets in the water and she's actually gonna tease me and says, well, maybe we should baptize you. And, you know, cause she just wants to dunk me. I accidentally took her a little bit seriously and said, Oh, okay. Okay. And so then she realizes this is serious. We're going to do this. And so she calls over her niece and they, and they start to pray for me and ask me the questions. Am I here of my free will? Am I doing this any under pressure? No. And down I went and I came up and I want a t-shirt. <laughs> I'd like I want a t-shirt and then and so what happened next was even I mean, that was beautiful it was it was real and what happened next was even better and that's you, you could tell that better okay so yeah so and after it was done I went this man's willingness to just say yeah let's do it there were nine other people that jumped in the pool and said, I want to be baptized too. It was so awesome. One of the stories, my sister who has at one point knew Christ and then left and led a horrific life. God rescued her back. And now she was telling me, God, like a layers of onion, God peeling off the hurts, the wounds, the the addictions, the chains, everything that was there. Man, praying over her, the spirit just ascended. And I and the Lord just laid, laid it on my heart as I was praying over her. You have her dunk herself because she's leaving those old things, those chains, those things behind. As I just, I put my hand on her and I said, okay, now you go submerge in that water and come up refreshed. And as, as circumstance, she's her starting a new life, uh, getting that they... Um, Later that, they gave an engagement. He gave her an engagement ring. She's getting married. Her new the intendant now, he's like, I want to be baptized. And then, like I said, baptism after. <laughs> Young adults, some in our families just said, time to rededicate. And it was so awesome to see, you know. And we said only this family would take a full pool party and turn it into a Holy Ghost revival <laughs> of baptism. But it was so awesome to see what God is doing. And so our Seagull Sunday about going was all about that and and leading us and guiding us one last plug i want to say we got a, a text out saying hey would you help the youth would you help the youth go to camp it was so impactful in my life i said i cannot not help so us not having any children that are going donated if you have any spare change any few dollars 
sow it into the seeds of our young people. That's the next generation that's going to lead us into the fruition of change in this atmosphere, new lives being changed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I love that. I love that. And there's, there's two things that are so important to me. Like water baptism, again, it's, it's just simply, it's a, it's a biblical uh, example that Jesus gives us. And it's, it's us saying, I want to be like Jesus. If Jesus did it, I'm doing it. And it's following Jesus, becoming a true disciple of Jesus. And so Ken, Ken's been in process. Ken's been observing and watching and growing in his faith. And he's in, in, in this perfect moment in the family pool during a family gathering. That sh- you, like you were at the mountaintop there, top that family gathering, right? But in that moment, Ken's like, yeah, yeah, this has been on my heart for a while. And, and the, the time is now. And I love the fact that it had nothing to do with the Sunday experience. That's what we're all about. We're equipping the saints, giving it away so that you can do the work of what Jesus has called us to do all on your own. I, I love doing it up here together, but man, if, if moments present themselves, we seize them for God's glory and, and we, we do the work of the church because that's what God has called us to do. Amen? Amen, amen. Okay, I want to talk about dreams. I got limited time and a lot of content. That's like the worst equation ever, right? So... I want to talk about dreams because I think it's something that God has been speaking to me about. So if you get nothing out of the sermon, just know that I am. So it's all good. So just enjoy it for me, okay? So we live in a nation full of dreams, right? We come from all over the world to live the American dream. A lot of us uh, may may, may say for ourselves, yeah, I feel like I'm living some version of the American dream. I've, I've pursued things. I've done things. I've experienced success in my life. I am living the American dream. People come from all over to experience that. We, we live in a, in, in a nation that has is, is experienced dreams realized. Alexander Bell, at the ripe age of 29, realized his childhood dream of creating a voice machine. He actually married a lady that, that, w- that was deaf because of a disease as a child. And he, part of his desire was like, I want to help my, vo- my, 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 my wife. Like, I want to help her, uh, like, hear, hearing aids. And that was a part of the whole process that he started. Martin Luther King, he lived his life to fulfill a dream of race equality and justice. Came across this story. Gaylord Perry, he's a major, major league pitcher who actually had to hit sometimes. He was in the National League, so he had a, actually had to take a swing. And uh, he was taking a swing one time during batting practice, and his man, manager said, gosh, this Gaylord Perry, um, he, there, there's a better chance they will land a man on the moon before Gaylord Perry actually hits a home run. That's what he said. Just, he's just like, whatever. He said, mark my words. Seven years later, 547 bats, uh, batting appearances later, Gaylord Perry hit his first ever home run on July 20th, 1969, the same day Apollo 11 landed on the moon. The exact same day. You can't make that up. It's crazy. It's crazy. But, but his, his dream was realized of hitting a major league home run. I think of Elon Musk, and I don't know what your opinion is, is of him, but this guy is living with big dreams. SpaceX, if, you, if you've heard of SpaceX, SpaceX exists to colonize the planet Mars. Elon Musk has this dream in his heart to colonize Mars by the year 2026. It's coming up fast. I read an article the other day said by, that they're, they're thinking by, by 2024, they may be, be able to actually get, get a spaceship on Mars. They're, they're shooting for that window, 2024. It's amazing. So there, there is big dreams. And, and as I think about those stories, I think about my life, what God's been speaking to me, uh, very simply, God says, never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming. We have to live with a dream until our very last breath. The, the medium age of inventors is 47. Somebody like, I'm getting, I'm getting old, all these inventors are young, whatever. No, 47 is the medium age of inventors. Gutenberg changed the world when he invented the printing press in his 50s. Chicken was never the same after Harold Sanders found a KFC at age 65. Come on. My 50 plus crowd. Who's my 50 plus crowd? Are you here? Never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming. God has designed us to dream. We were made to dream because we were made in God's image. It says this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. 
So we were created in God's image. And guess what? When God speaks, when God thinks, he creates. God has designed us in his image with the ability to think, to dream, and to create. And that's how God wants us to operate. So we are glorifying God. We are, we are operating in his image when we allow the dreams and desires that he's given us to flow and to scroll through our minds. Again, never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming. I've, I've been around a lot of death recently. Some of you know some of the, the family that has passed in the past two years for us. And one thing that I've noticed, there is family members that have passed with a dream in their heart. And you could tell they were, they were chugging. They were going to their last breath. And there, there are others that just disconnected the heart, disconnected the mind, and they were just waiting just to die. Never stop dreaming. I, I think we honor God the most when we press in and we, we pursue the dreams that, that, that he has put within us. And understand this. When God wants to change a person, a family, a legacy, a community, or a city, he starts by putting a dream in someone's heart for change. Dreams often represent change that, that God has ordained, that God wants to see in, in your personal life, in someone else's life, in, in your city, in your neighborhood, in your business. Dreams represent the change that God has ordained to come about. And so we have to live with, with, with dreams in our hearts that God has ordained, that, that God puts life into us. We see this happen with Joseph. Joseph, the, the guy that had the coat of many colors, we see that, uh, that God put a dream in his heart, in his mind, that would save a nation and, and, and really change the course and the destiny of, of his family. Powerful dreams that, that God given him. And really the, the, the context is that uh, Joseph had two dreams. He was the youngest of his brothers, and, and he was the favorite. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But God gave Joseph two dreams, and he shared these dreams with his brothers, and they're like, you're a dead man. We don't like you. They're, they're like, what you're saying, and the dreams were essentially that they were going to bow down someday to worship him. And they're saying, your dreams, if we hear this right, your dreams mean that you're going to rule and reign over us? No way. No way. They, they, they actually despised Joseph. But understand this. Joseph received his dream at age 17. That dream came to fruition at age 37. Joseph had 20 years of stewarding a dream that was full of betrayal and lies, perceived failure, dashed hopes, near-death experiences, hurts and wounds. 20 years of enduring all of this, this stuff. And, and in between, when the dreams came and when they were fulfilled, it probably looked like nothing was, nothing was going to work out. The, like the dream was dead. But it wasn't. I'm telling you what, I, I'll talk about the seagull dream in my heart. I've had that dream for about two years. I'm like, okay, God, if I, have to, if I have to shoulder on for 20 years to realize the dream that you've given me, I'll do it. It's worth it. It's worth it. So we got to shoulder on with the dreams that God has given us. And understand this, Joseph, he never gave up. He never lost hope. He never let go of the dream that God had given him. There was zero mention of him relenting or letting go of what God had placed within his heart. And my desire today is that you would realize the dream that God has given you. And it, it may seem so far-fetched, but only God. But only God. And that's how we need to dream. We need to dream with the reality that, man, if God doesn't do this, I don't know how it's going to happen. Because you know what? Then, then, then it may not be God's dream for your life. It may simply be your dream that you feel like you can accomplish. We want God-sized dreams that only he can make happen. So as we talk about this, I want, I want to share from, from uh, the life of Joseph, restraints to the dreams. Things that are going to hold us back from receiving the dream that God has given us. Because I think, I think there's a lot of dreams deep within us. I really don't think receiving the dream is the problem. I really don't. I think the problem is that we get in the way. We, we kind of trip up on the dream. We, we, we hold it back. We want to get our hands all over God's dream that he's given us to, to pursue and to steward. So if you don't have a dream, ask God for it. But if you have the dream, here we go. We're going to unpack a few key things that I think we learned from the life of Joseph that, that's going to help us remove barriers to pursue the dream that God has for us. The first thing is this. The first thing that, that holds us back, that restrains us, from pursuing God's dream, from, from realizing God's dream is pride and jealousy. Motives of the heart. Pride and jealousy, motives of the heart. Young people, listen up. Genesis chapter 3 verse, I'm sorry, chapter 37 verse 3 says, Now Israel, it's Joseph's dad, 
loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. He made an, an ornate robe for him. Pause right there. There was favor upon Joseph. And you need to understand that when a dream comes, that's the favor of God upon your life. If God has given you a dream, realize that's just not your great idea. That's the favor of God blessing you with vision, with insight, with discernment of what you can see in the future. It's not there yet, but you see something and you realize something that God has dropped upon you. That's the favor of God, right? So when his brothers saw that the father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So Joseph had this extreme favor of God, uh, of, of his heavenly father, and, and that was represented in the coat of many colors. It signified a position of favor, pro, a prominent standing, and birthright. Because of that coat, uh, Jacob was saying, you know what? Joseph's going to get my birthright. He may be the youngest, which usually goes to the oldest, the birthright does, but Joseph's going to get my birthright because I, I have favor. I see greatness in him. And his brothers were jealous. There's a tremendous amount of jealousy that they operated with because guess what? They wanted his dream. They wanted his dream. There's times when I'm scrolling through my Instagram and I got a lot of friends in ministry. I got a lot of friends all over. I got a lot of friends, okay? So I'm scrolling through and I see my friends and what they're doing and how they're living. I'm like, I, f I, feel, I feel it. I'm like, wow, that must be nice. Wow, look at their success. Wow, look at the dream that they're living. And, and I, there's a tension. And I have to catch myself, like, am I, am I trying to step into their dream? Is there jealousy creeping in about how they're living or, or their, their definition of success? And I have to be very careful that I don't begin to cross into envy or desiring someone else's dream or really begrudging someone. The brothers, they, they had this, this angst and this, this like dislike because there was favor on this guy. There was success all over him. There was prominence and, and prestige. And they, they were jealous and they disliked him. There was, they begrudged his dream. So we got to be careful. We don't get into the space where all of a sudden we are, we are hating on someone else's dream or someone else's progression. Again, that, that's going to hold us back from our very own dream. So understand this. The motives of your heart will directly impact the favor of God upon your life. The motives of your heart will directly impact the favor of God upon your life. Um, we strive for a pure heart so that the favor of God will fall upon us. And then everything we do, just like what Joseph talks about, everything that he did succeeded. Even, even being imprisoned and jailed, he had success in those environments because the favor of God was upon him because the motives of his heart were pure. Purify your heart. Again, young people, purify your heart. Get your motives right. Get focused on Jesus. And, and, and let God's blessing be upon you. Next thing is this. Things that hold us back. Unforgiveness. Holding on to offense unforgiveness, holding on to offense. It says this in Genesis, Genesis chapter 37, verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, he was going to check up on them. Again, he was in a position of prestige. He was in charge of overseeing their work. So his father said, hey, go, let's, let's send you out. And this is when his brothers turn on him. It says when Joseph came to his brothers, checking up on their work, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. His brothers stripped him of his dream and everything that defined him. Joseph had a lot of reason to operate with unforgiveness. There was a lot of people close to him that offended him and that wronged him. But there's no mention in Scripture that he held a grudge, that he had this, this, this anger towards them. If anything, when we get to the end of the story, when Joseph is blessing them and, and giving them what they needed, there's, there's a brokenness and a great love for these men that, that had wronged him. And so understand this. If there's unforgiveness, if there's hurt and pain that you have yet to reconcile and deal with, that will hold you back from realizing the, 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 the dream that God has put in your heart. When we hold on to offense, we can't hold on to the dream that God has given us. I think I have that up there. It says this. Um, you can't hold on to the dream and hold on to, for, uh, to unforgiveness at the same time. You have to choose. Are you going to hold on to unforgiveness or are you going to hold on to the dream? Right? And, and, and I, I, when I, I'm talking about this, realizing there's a lot of us that, that, that wrestle with this. There's, there's, we get wronged. We get hurt. Pe people say things. 
Joseph, it was, it was his family members, people closest to us, maybe don't believe in us, maybe want to take us down, maybe want to speak ill of our dream. We have to choose. Are we going to hold on to the dream or hold on to unforgiveness? Choose the dream every, tr- every time. Amen? What does it say in Frozen? Let it go. Is that, is that the line? Let it go? Yeah, I think it goes like that. Let it go? Cool. I'll say this too. Get the help that you need. Get the help. Like, let it go. Okay, let it go. Got it. Awesome. Frozen. Okay. Here's what that means. Confess your unforgiveness to someone. To get it out. It's here. Get it out. Get it out. Hey, I, I got, uh, like, talk, talk to someone. Like, it doesn't have to be the person, but just say, I got this issue. Like, this person, they did this, and I, I don't know what to do. Confess it. Confide it. Confide in someone. Get wisdom. Process with someone. And then confront it. You got to confront it head on. It's not going to go away by, by, by pushing it to the side. You have to confront it and then get the healing that you need so that you can offer forgiveness to someone. All right, third thing is this. Things that hold us back. Fear and control, protecting the dream. More often than not, if we operate with the spirit of fear and control, it's because you're trying to protect something. I've got to protect myself. I've got to protect the dream. I've got to protect the kids. I've got to protect the business. I've got to protect the money. You're trying to protect something, so you operate with a large degree of fear and control. That's not from the Lord. When we, when, historically, when we look at Scripture and how the, 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 the heroes of the faith operate, they were out of control. They, they were not in control because God was and, and they relinquish control to God, saying, God, I don't know what I'm doing, or I'm in over my head, or this is way bigger than me, or this dream I stepped into, it's, it's becoming a nightmare real fast, because I, I, I got to give it to you, God. You are in control. So we have, to, we have to give God the dream. Joseph was sold into slavery and imprisoned. He had no control over his dream. But guess what? His favor was upon him. Despite what was going on in his life, God was in control, authoring Joseph's dream. God was his protector and provider. And I'm reminded as I think about Joseph, how he lived his life, I'm sure he didn't expect to be sold into slavery. I'm sure he didn't expect to be accused of adultery with Potiphar's wife. I'm sure he didn't expect to have all these really bad things happen to him. But he said, God, you know what? Your, your plan B, C, D, E, and F is better than my plan A. So God, whatever plan I'm on with you, God, that's the plan I want to be about. If, if, if it's your plan for my life, God, I am with you. And I've always said God, God's perfect will plan for life, it is, it is windy and all over the place. It is not linear. You, if you're going to walk with God, it is never in a straight line. <laughs> I'm just going to let you know, like, if, if you're walking through the valley, it's a... It's a, it's a Straight line, but if you're going to go to the mountaintop with the Lord, you are switchbacking and zigzagging all over the place to get to where he wants you to go, right? So we got to trust God with his plan and surrender it to him. And as we do that, then we experience God's amazing plans for our life. So I want to say this to, to, to somebody today. Don't quit believing in God. I don't know what year you're in or where you're in your process with, with the dream God's given you. Don't quit believing in God and don't quit believing in who God has called you to be. God has something for you and we press into that amazing plan for, for the life that, 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 that he has for us. I want you to understand this about belief. Belief tells us that our present circumstances don't define our future reality. Just soak that in. Belief, faith, tells us that our present circumstances don't define our future reality. Some of you have been through some really tough stuff. Really, like there's specific words for the things that you've been through. It's hard, right? Brokenness, divorce, sickness, pain, death, betrayal, lies. Like there's so many things that we could, we could define what you've been through. But when you get on the other side, you're like, you know what? My circumstances back then, it doesn't define who I am today. God is faithful. God is good. God can work through the junk. God can work through, through the crap. I can get through the valley to get to the mountaintop. That's how God works. And so we press on through it. And so understand this today. Like, I don't know where you're at, but your present circumstances don't define your future reality. Just, we got to understand that the, the future is the dream, and we look towards the dream. That is the reality. The circumstances are not the reality. God's dream for your life, that is the reality, and that's what we hold on to. 
Joseph, again, 20 years of dreaming, 20 years of enduring hardship, 20 years of brokenness uh, brought him to this place where, again, 20 years at age 37, the dream was fulfilled. And understand this, his fulfilled dream gave him the ability to provide for others and really help their dream come alive. People were dying. People were, were, were destitute. But the dream that, that God gave Joseph that he held on to, that, that enabled and empowered other people's dreams to be sustained and to have life. I'll tell you what. Seago Church, um, uh, it's, not, it's not what I dreamed it would be. It's not what I, two years ago, this isn't what I dreamed it would be. That, but that was my plan A. And I don't say that in a sad way. Um, I walked into this situation open hand saying, God, whatever you want to put in this hand or my heart, God, let's do it. I had no clue what it was going to be. And God said, go to Utah and start a church. And then we started that. And he's like, oh, by the way, there's a pandemic coming. So just be ready for that too. Okay, have fun with that one. So it, it kind of changed everything. But guess what? The dream hasn't changed. Our strategy, tactics had to change. But the dream never changed. The dream never changed. I love the local church. And I want to see the bride of Christ, which is you guys, shine. I love the local church. I want to, I already said it, but I want to start a movement, not just build the church. And so if you're here thinking, oh, this is really great, awesome, this, we've arrived. We have not arrived, we've just started, okay? Because I want to see a movement, not just build the church. I want to make disciples of Jesus, not count converts or crowds. And that's not indicting anyone other than just this is what we want to be about. We want to, I want to see more Ken and Angela's tell me stories of, 10 plus people that they baptized in their family gathering that has nothing to do with our baptismal tank, but everything to do with what God is doing in and through you. That's discipleship. That's what I want to see. I want to invest and pour into your dream so we can, fill, so we can fulfill Seagull's God side's dream together. I want to pour into your dream so that we can, we can live out God's dream for this church together. I don't want to, it's not my dream that I do by myself. It's a dream God has given Seagull Church to steward together. So I want to invest and pour into your dream. I want to help you accomplish your dream because guess what? You want to do that for me. You've, you've told me. Many of you have told me, like, we're with you. We want to help you. The dream that God has given us together is a beautiful thing, and it's to build this church to see it established, and we get to do that together. I want to see the captives set free, the broken healed, and God's church thrive and multiply like never before. I want to be a part of the great awakening in the Salt Lake Valley, in the state of Utah. Utah has been said that, that there's never been a true spiritual awakening in the state of Utah. That changes with this generation. That changes in, in this season. It's going to happen. I believe it. So circumstances tell me that it's going to take a little longer. It's going to be more challenging. It's going to require far more grit and spiritual sweat than I anticipated. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. We, 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 can, we can shoulder up because we're all about the plan and the dream that God has for us because we know where there's vision, there's provision, and God will make a way when there is no way. It's a beautiful thing. As I close, Death Valley. Death Valley holds the record for the hottest place on earth. 134 degrees was recorded on July 10th, 1913. It's the, one of the lowest elevations in the world. That's why it gets so hot. But I, on, on October 2016, in that month, there was a tremendous rainfall that, that blew over Death Valley. It's called Death Valley because nothing survives in Death Valley. Nothing can grow there. But in October of 2016, it, it started the rainy season, and an inch and a half of rain fell on the ground and caused what they call a super bloom, a super bloom. And that means that, that, that water fell, and all of a sudden, life came into perspective. And in what, one of the guys that works there, that has lived there. He, this is what he said. He said, he said, I've lived in Death Valley for 25 years, and I've seen lots of blooms in Death Valley. I kept thinking I was seeing incredible blooms. I was always very excited until I saw one of these super blooms. And then I suddenly realized there are so many seeds out there that, that are just waiting to sprout, just waiting to grow. I had no idea that there was so much out there. Here's what it looks like when the super bloom came. This is Death Valley where nothing grows. Nothing grows in Death Valley. But what this guy who works at Death Valley was saying, 
I've seen little blooms here and there before. But when the conditions are right, when the circumstances align with God's perfect plan for your life, for Death Valley, guess what? All the seeds, all the dreams, they were there. They were just hidden. And the refreshing rain of God came and life sprouted up. And we can scroll through those pictures. So you may be in a dry desert season. You may be wandering through your your desert. But guess what? In due season, the dreams are going to come alive. Life's going to come. Because that is the very nature of God for your life, for this valley, for your future. And we speak life over you. I want to partner with you to accomplish the things that God has put in your heart. Because we do it together. That's the body of Christ. That's the beauty of it. But new life's going to come. The rains are going to come. The refreshment of God's going to come. His provision's going to come for the dreams to be realized. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for stories of biblical saints that never gave up, God. God, they never gave up on the dream. I thank you that Joseph never gave up. He never got bitter. He never, he never chose to, to let go and pursue something else. God, he stayed the course for the dream that you put on in his heart at a young age. God, I pray you raise us up to be Josephs that are, that are full of grit, that are full of determination to get your best. No matter what it looks like, God, we want to get your best and be faithful to the very end. So God, I pray that dreams would be dropped. I pray that dreams would be revived. God, I pray for your your refreshing uh, rain to come, to water the dreams that are embedded deep within our hearts that are even hidden, that no one knows. God, I pray for such a time as this, that the dreams would come alive, that the very nature of God would, would begin to come out, that dreams would come alive in this season, I pray. All for your glory, God. All for your glory, in Jesus' name. One last moment before we close. If you're here today, we talk about dreams and we talk about what God does and the nature of God. We need to understand it starts with Jesus. Every head is bowed and eyes closed. It's a personal moment right now. But we talk about Jesus. It all starts with saying yes to Jesus. So if you're ready to say, you know what, I, I want I want a new beginning. I want the dreams to come alive within me, but I, I don't really know Jesus on a personal level. This is the day that you say yes to Jesus. So if you're here in this room and you want to accept Jesus in your heart to be your Lord and your Savior, or maybe for some of you want to rededicate your heart to Jesus, can you just simply raise your hand? And I just want to pray a very simple prayer with you. Awesome. Awesome. If you want to say yes to Jesus, just raise your hand. Anyone else? Awesome. Awesome. Three young people. Praise God. Anyone else? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Church, very simply, we're just going to pray a prayer. It says in Romans that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, we will be saved. It starts with a belief and a confession with our mouths, literally speaking out what we know is true and what we want. So we're just going to pray this simple prayer together. You can repeat after me, everybody together. Dear Jesus. I thank you for coming into this world and dying for my sins. You made a way when there was no way. Jesus, I need you. I give you my heart. Give you all that I am. I choose to live for you. Give me your dreams. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, we had three people raise their hand for salvation. That's awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, we're, we're going we're gonna to move into a time of communion as we close. Um, as we prepare our hearts for that, we are going to sing this song. Um, we have some new communion cups right underneath your seat. Super easy, but we're, I'll, I'll lead us together through communion. But we're just going to sing together just for a moment. Go ahead and stand with us. I want to just encourage you, if you don't know the words to the song, 
sometimes what, what we need is just to let the words speak over us. We don't need to speak out the words. And so if you don't know the words or you just want this song to be on your heart, just close your eyes and let it speak over you. Let it soak into your heart. The king of my heart, the king of your heart, that means putting him in that right place, letting him be the king of who we are. Thank you, Jesus. We're here to worship God. Here to worship God. The King of my heart. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow. take the, the bread. The bread represents the broken body of Jesus. And we know that Jesus came to this earth and he walked this earth as a, as a human even though he was superhuman. He was something that the world had never seen before. He was divine. But yet he chose to walk this world to give us an example of how to live but also to bear our sins and our infirmities. So as we take this bread, we're going to remember the life that Jesus lived just for us and, and what he endured so that we could be forgiven and free. So dear Jesus, as we hold this bread, we think about the stories, we think about how you lived and the shame that you endured on the cross and the weight of sin that was upon your body. We think about the brokenness that you had experienced as you passed from, from this life into eternity. And Jesus, we say thank you. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed. We thank you that your broken body brought about the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Jesus. So in these moments, we remember the price, the great price that was paid for us. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Let's partake of the bread. Then as we hold the cup, we know that it was the shed blood of Jesus that forgives our sins, that washes our sins away as far as the east is from the west. And I think that I love most that I have to remind myself is that when I truly walk in the forgiveness that Jesus offers me, all of my sins, all of my wrongs have been forgiven and erased. There's no mention of them in heaven. They're done with, they're dealt with because of what Jesus has done on the cross for me. So I, I hold on to nothing but Jesus. So church, we're going to take the, the cup and we're going to remember the price that was paid, but also the refreshing and renewal 
that comes when we abide in Jesus. So I thank you, Jesus, right now that we are forgiven people, that we've been washed in your blood, forgiven and whole, brought into right standing because of what you have done for us, Jesus, not because of us, but because of you. So we thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross, forgiving our sins. We remember and honor and choose to live for you today in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the cup. Amen, amen. Okay, one last time. We're going to worship as forgiven and free people because of what Jesus has done for us. Let's do it, church. Amen. Amen. Yes, you can praise. You can worship. We're going to sing our praise because...